Hey, everybody. Welcome to our live chat. Uh, it's time for our monthly chat with Lynn, and Lynn is connecting right now. So as she gets connected, I will just introduce this topic, which we're loosely calling. Hi, Lynn. Welcome. How are you? Oh, good. How are you? Great. I was just uh, starting our chat by sharing with the audience that I should probably give a disclaimer that this topic is a peeve of mine, which is why I wanted to talk about I wanted to talk to you about it because I get so buggered up when people apply, apply these stereotypes to, to breeds and there are generalizations we can make, but horses are horses and they're individuals. And I get really kind of annoyed when people have blinders on and they think a horse is a specific way because it is this breed. But then most recently, one of the reasons I reached out to you to cover this topic with me was in my own barn, I started to notice it was a safety issue because I have a particular student that has a breed that, you know, typically is on the calmer side to make, again, a generalization. But her particular horse isn't, you know, the breed itself, I would say, is calmer, but her horse isn't. And, you know, it spooks at the trash truck and it it it, it is a little bit more reactive they're not a good fit. And I've encouraged the person to, to purchase a, a different horse. It would be a better fit for her, but she has it in her head that no, there's this breed, you know, she's really adopted this storyline that this breed is the only breed that doesn't spook on the trail. And I want to be a trail rider. And I think, first of all, that's disrespectful to so many other lovely horses out there. My own horse is a half Arabian and he is as reliable as they come. And so that's just a false narrative, but also you're not seeing your horse in that breed for, for truly what it is. They, they're not machines. They do spook. They do react to things and to, to come at them every day with the assumption that's never going to happen is really a safety issue. I think if you, if yeah. you really buy deeply into these stereotypes. So anyway, that's my peeve. I've unloaded it. <laughs> We're <laughs> Where do you want to start? <laughs> oh, well, you know, I, th I think that that's a really important point. We have to uh, accept each horse for who he is. And you might have a horse whose breed is notoriously spooky and he can be so rock solid like yours. And you can have exactly what you just described, a horse who just isn't as calm as his breed is re reputed to be. And it, I agree that's disrespectful to the to the horse because they're not seeing the horse for who he is. And I think this is where the breed stereotypes, and I, I noticed you did put the stereotypes in the title. The, the stereotype is, is always a tricky, sort of a swampy sort of place to be because there may be some reason behind it or there may not. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and there's always individual variations in horses. And imagining that um, yeah. th that a horse is going to be calm because he's a certain breed is, is a, yeah, it's it's a false narrative and a and a fantasy that just isn't going to take you any place good. But on the other hand, there's also some fascinating traits that come with breeds, and I think if we see them for who they are and what they are, they can give us fascinating glimpses into the way our horses think and the history of their breed and why they why they may have some of the traits that they do i think yeah i agree and i i think having exposure to a broad diversity of breeds i've enjoyed it personally as a trainer i think it does enrich trainers experiences for sure again that's my own bias um on that point but what are yeah what are some of your thoughts i mean picking up on what you just said in terms of, of having these experiences with different breeds that may or may not adhere to their stereotypes. Um, what we learn from that, what we glean from that, what does that bring us? Does it make it more valuable uh, to us as trainers? Oh, I think so. Because if you think about the reasons behind it, it's like anything else with the horse. If you look at the reasons behind his behavior, the, the, the emotions that are there, um, and the thought process, then we understand them better. 
and and it's more enjoyable to try to to relate and engage. So my particular fascination is with Arabians because my bronze is Arabian and, and that's the breed whose history <clears throat> I have studied most. <clears throat> so so Arabians have this stereotype of being spooky airheads. And in fact, when I bought bronze, that was pretty much the reaction, even from people I respected, like you got an Arabian, those are spooky airheads. Hey, well, he's not. He's he is a descendant of war horses. Um, so if you look back at the Arabian breed, they were bred um, for tribal warfare and for hunting big game. And so some of their behaviors make perfect sense in that light. Uh, one of the, the statistically uh, documented things is that Arabians react more strongly to sudden movement than other breeds do. Mm -hmm. So why would that be? Well, uh, in, in, in battle or in a hunt, um, no two battles or hunts are going to be the same. So you can't train a horse to repetitively do what you already know he's going to have to do. You have to work this out in the moment. So if somebody's coming at you with a spear or a boar is charging you, um, you don't want your horse to stand around waiting for instructions. You want him to move fast, get you both out of the way, and then get his follow-up instructions on the fly. Mm -hmm. And so that makes sense of the Arabian's spooky behavior. It's yep. not because they're airheads. It's because they survive by reacting fast to any potentially perceived danger. Yep. And uh, and if you understand that, then you can respect that as as a you know sort of the legacy of of their ancestry and the re the uh, jobs that they were bred to do. Yeah, and, I, and let's just stick with Arabians for for a second because. Well, I, I tend to have a, again, generally speaking, I have a fondness for them. They're, I, they're just so athletic and smart and friendly and they're just delightful. Again, generally speaking. But what I find is, again, to go back to whether or not it's valuable for, for horsemen and women to have experience with other breeds, I find in this instance, if we just take this breed as an example, it can be helpful for me as somebody helping other people to have experiences with other breeds because Occasionally, I do get somebody who shows up for a lesson on an Arabian that doesn't fit sort of that norm that you just described. He might be a, like a lazy, really not quick moving kind of a soldier. And the person will be really frustrated because he's not fitting the breed stereotype, right? The, the, <laughs> an Arabian, he's supposed to be all feisty and really forward and energetic. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, well, he's a little bit more warm blood e to, you know, to use another generalization. And so having experience with those sort of colder blooded, slower moving horses, that's how I believe we should approach the training to be fair to who this individual is. But if I, I think if I didn't have experience with other breeds, I wouldn't be able to, you know, think quick on my feet and have those tools um, at my disposal to treat the horse as an individual who's, you know, most Arabs kind of fit what you describe, but not all of them. Certainly, I've seen some real pokey types. <laughs> sure, and and this is part of understanding that each horse is an individual who may or may not fit the typical patterns of their breed. And your experience then with different horses gives you the tools. You know, you you have the experience to motivate a a warm blood or another slow horse, and now you have the experience to um, to focus a horse who's more energetic. And um, Arabians also are kind of known to be independent thinkers. And you can see why they had to be to survive. And so if you don't enjoy that, then you need to look for an Arabian who is more willing to just go with whatever you tell him to do or get a different breed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But in, in, in each case, it's gonna be, you need to have the, um, the recognition that each horse is an individual. So I see the, the experience with different breeds as, as the way we develop more skills in training and relating to the horses, but not as a way to peg horses into a certain pigeonhole. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Appreciate that. And then also, you know, I was wondering if we could talk briefly about uh, physiology. I, I think I saw on somebody had posted or maybe some a few people on your Facebook page about 
accounting for the difference in physiology. And that can be a value in understanding different breed types. And I wholeheartedly agree, especially with, especially with different muscle fiber types. Um, you know, the colder blooded slow, uh, well, the colder blooded horses sometimes actually have a higher density of fast twitch muscle fibers. Like a lot of the quarter horses in the hind quarter muscle have a higher percentage of uh, fast twitch muscle fibers. Ditto for horses like halflingers and some of the draftier breeds. Um, even though they're usually a cooler burn, calmer, sort of steady Freddy. Um, so knowing how to work with those muscle types and how long to do or not do particular exercises in any given day really is important, I think, for whether or not the horse enjoys his life on a, on a daily basis. And also if they make gains, because some horses you need to, like Arabians, I believe, because of their genetic makeup, I believe when they or schooling, they benefit from longer intervals, not repetitive. But what I mean is they could get into a canner, for example, and stay in the canner for several minutes and do different exercises within the canner and be making gains. Whereas some of these other um, colder blooded breeds, depending on their physiology, they need more frequent rest breaks. They need um, more strategic application of exercises. So you get some propulsive exercises followed by, again, more breaks. Um, so that that's really important to not, to make gains and not burn these horses out. And I think that only comes from trial and error with different breeds to, to understand because within any breed, you can have these differences and be able to identify them, I think. Anyway, what I, I know that you had some chatter on your Facebook page about some of the physiology. So what are some of your thoughts there in terms of gaining access to it and exposure? Well, we, before we leave what you said, um, the knowledge of different breeds at least gives you a starting point. You know, you have a horse of a certain breed come in, then you know that a certain way of working with them physically tends to be successful with that breed. At least you have an idea where to start. And if that isn't exactly right for that horse, then you can adapt. But um, you recognize that there are these differences. And I think this may be a very overlooked area that makes a difference between whether horses enjoy their work or don't enjoy their work. Yeah, I remember having a lesson with, uh, this was so many years ago, but I paid to take a lesson with like a visiting fancy trainer from Germany. And I was riding a student's horse. I think it was an Anglo-Arabian or, or something with a lot of thoroughbred in it. And we got most of the way through a very frustrating, unsuccessful lesson. Everybody was stressed. I was stressed. The horse was stressed. It wasn't good. And we get to the end of the lesson and the instructor says to me, like, yeah, my methods, they, they're they not, they're, they're good, but they don't work for this kind of horse. And I thought, well, if you can recognize that, like, why don't you modify your delivery? <laughs> like, I'm paying a lot of money. We're both stressed <laughs> out. <laughs> well, Exactly. That's and that's the hallmark of a good instructor is to be able to make that that adaptation as you talk about doing for the horses that you work with, and then you can help their owners understand how to best work with their particular physiology and needs. Yeah, well, hopefully, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so you, you, and you asked me a question. So, oh yes, the, uh, one of the ones that particularly intrigued me was the uh, comment about the Frisians. Yeah. That they need a, a different sort of warm up than other breeds. Uh, that's not a stereotype. That's something apparently that Frisian owners observed and then has been, uh, been documented through research. Mm -hmm. So that would be an important thing for somebody to know, you know, if you get a specific breed, it's helpful to understand these, these things about that breed. Yeah, some of those <clears throat> Frisians, you know, some of them have smaller lung capacity. I, I think they're breeding a, a little bit different now. So so hopefully some of that's changed. But some of those horses that that have a hard time shedding heat, I mean, horses generate a lot of heat when they exercise. They're not terribly efficient that way. So some of those horses like uh, Frisians, even some of the gated breeds, some of the quarter horses, you know, if they're generating a lot of heat when you're working them, especially in the summer months you have to account for that because they're, you're not making physiological gains in your work, which is the goal of schooling and conditioning horses, I think, is to help them improve. So I thought that that was a great, I saw somebody had posted that article about Frisians that I'd read when it came out, which was terrific. So horses of that body type, um, 
to cool, to shed heat. We, we need to build that into sessions when you have that kind of a horse. You need to pay attention. You can't just override their physiology. Where Whereas there are horses like a thorough, I mean, I've had some thoroughbreds come for less and they can be cantering around the hot sun for 20 plus minutes. <laughs> you know, they're not, they're, they're just, everything's evaporating. They're just doing fine. Whereas, you know, the Icelandics, they need, you know, whoop, let's take a break. Let's catch our breath again. <laughs> you know, they're all different. Mm -hmm. and, and that comes through exposure to different breeds and, and paying attention, I think too, but anyway. Yes. Um, but you're saying there's certain body types that have, um, more, um, did have more difficulty with heat yep. than others, right? Yeah. 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 Shedding heat. Yeah. I mean, all horses generate a lot of heat when they exercise, but uh, some of them with the veins closer to the surface are able to evaporate much and, and the leaner muscle, you know, so they don't have such a thermal layer. They're able to shed heat faster. So typically the horses that excel in endurance, part of the reason why is they, they can recover, um, no matter how much heat they're generating. So Jackie just submitted a question. What about the physiology of mules? To be honest, I wish I knew more. I know very little. You are right that their muscle function is different. And I always encounter that in physio physiological studies, but I haven't been able to find some real clear research on how and why they differ. So Jackie, if you come across any, please send it my way. I'm fascinated by mules, fascinated. I don't think that they're, muscles store the same amount of metabolic waste that our domesticated horses do. That's my understanding. But anyway, I'd, I'd love to learn more. So if you see anything, send it my way. <laughs> and behaviorally, I've seen that, that mules uh, think differently. They have uh, some different uh, cognitive abilities than horses do. And, and that's something that mule owners do seem to be very much aware of, um, that they, they do think differently. <laughs> Um, so maybe we should look at if, if is it more important for uh, to, to know the for, for to have experience with different breeds in the basic training or in their advanced training? Because I'm wondering, basic training, what we want to, a horse to learn is very similar. We, we really want, you know, the ba basic ground manners, basic riding manners and a positive attitude and, and all that. How different is that if you're just starting a horse out? How different is that from one breed to another, do you think? I mean, I know behaviorally, certainly it's going to be different. Well, you know, it's interesting. I'm glad you asked that because I was thinking about this today, Lynn, because I have a young horse at my barn now. It's been a couple of years since I've had like a real baby. You know, I mean, he's like three now. It's not a baby. But, you know, we're so we're starting the young horse training. And I was thinking about this today, and I know that you're such a wonderful proponent of cultivating investigative behavior. And I was thinking about having exposure to different breeds and how that applies to these early stages of training, because I do think given different horses, um, sensitivity and quickness, they're cultivating that might take different approaches. So this guy I'm talking about is a little halflinger. So he's pretty, I mean, he's a pretty calm guy. He's not real explosive. There's, you know, he doesn't really get rattled. Um, typical young horse sort of gets distracted sometimes. But I do find myself um, navigating, cultivating that, um, keeping his curiosity sort of at the forefront, keeping him engaged with things without just getting pushy. You know what I mean? <laughs> Whereas, whereas I think some of the more um, sensitive horses, that curiosity from, from the early stages is kind of right there. I don't have to present a lot to them like I do with some of my older been around the block, seen everything sort of horses. Um, so I was, I was kind of mulling on that today. What are your thoughts in terms of, that's the first thing that comes to my mind with dif differences in the early stages, since I think that's what you just talked about, is is how do we get that 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 investigative behavior? What Does anything come to your mind? Well, the horses have, um, developmentally, the investigative behavior tends to be really strong when they're very young. And I think that it sort of fades out partly as a natural thing because in the wild horses would have investigated a lot of the environment, you know, to a full, everything's new. 
and by the time they're mature adults, I have been there, seen that. Um, but in but in domestic courses, I think it gets shut down a lot. Hmm. So they're told, no, you're supposed to be paying attention to me. Look at me. Pay attention to me. Don't be looking at this thing over there or listening to that thing over there. And so the investigative behavior gets shut down. And then as trainers, if we want the horse to be engaged in what we're doing and have the positive emotions that makes him want to be with us and, and do his work, then we need to re-engage the investigative behavior. So to me, if one would come in who already wants to be curious, who's already curious about things and wants to investigate things, I think that's a gift. That's great. Mm -hmm. You know, you go yeah. with it, encourage it. Um, because in, in a training session, the more positive emotion we, we uh, evoke in the horse, then the more he's going to want to be there, the more he's able to learn, and the more reliable and happy attitude he's going to have about his work as he goes as he goes through life. And investigative behavior generates all kinds of, of wonderful positive emotions and positive brain chemicals. So encouraging that is really a, a good way to keep the training sessions very positive for a horse, along with what you said about making sure that physically they're comfortable. Mm -hmm. Because physically, being physically uncomfortable, of course, is not going to uh, engage them in wanting to do more of whatever it is we want them to do. Mm. Yeah. Did I answer your question, Jack? I think I sort of got lost. No, I, I think... Um... I think this is all really interesting. I also think from the physiological standpoint with the young horses, because we were talking about, you know, early training is just early training, right? We're sort of learning the basics. So how, how important is it to have exposure to a lot of different breeds or not? I think from the physiological standpoint, and this sort of ties in with what I already said, but I do think it's valuable to understand the different, the different body types, the different at a very general level, the different um, physiological uh, types of horse, you know, does this horse mostly have slow twitch fibers or mostly have fast twitch fibers? Do they shed heat well? Do they, what's their stamina like? You know, because there are, again, general stereotypes we can make about their genetics. And I think with a young horse to keep that positive feeling that, that you were referencing, obviously if they're early tasks, don't totally stink and drain them and leave them feeling physically wrecked. I mean, we're way better off, right? So, but some horses, yeah. some of the youngsters benefit from getting in a task and staying in it longer and kind of finding their groove and finding their rhythm. Whereas some of the others, like this little halflinger guy, I think I have a better time uh, doing really short sessions with him. Um, multiple times a day, like three times a day, rather than in 10 minutes, rather than do one 30 minute session, because I find, I, I find him just sort of physically starting to drag. And I've noticed him starting to not have deep diaphragmatic breathing. Um, he's going to be kind of slow to mature, I think. But anyway, I think noting those physiological differences is important and whether or not the young horse enjoys their work, because then we can build on it. Yes. Well, what, what you're talking about involves um, tuning into his emotions. And I think, you know, I was thinking about what, what would I, in, in addition to hoping that, the tra that a trader knows something about my breed, what generally would I look for in a trainer um, that, that might um, compensate if the trainer isn't specifically familiar with a particular breed? And um, one of those things is having the horse's emotional state on their radar at all times. Mm -hmm. Because if you have the horse's emotional state on your radar, he's going to let you know if he's feeling uncomfortable. He'll let you know if he's confused, if he's excited about what you're doing. And then what you described doing with the uh, multiple short sessions is giving him thinking and processing time too. And I think people really underestimate that horses need some time to process new information. And if you give them too much at once and overload them, then um, they're not going to be able to process it. They're more likely to get anxious, confused, tune out. And with a youngster, a lot of th things are new. It's not like an older horse who's like, yeah, I, I know how to do all these other things. And so you're going to ask me to do one new thing or do something a little differently. I got, I got it. Uh, but a youngster, it's like, everything's new. You want me to do this? And wait, and, and how do I do that? And so that processing time, I think, can be really important. 
Yeah, I think and, what you described is like that, that makes that, that would be my priority in looking for a trainer, honestly, what you just described. Because sometimes people have these nice young horses or promising and they'll say, you know, it's time to get the horse broke to ride, get it under saddle. And I hear them say like, I'm going to send it, you know, two states over to so-and-so to train to ride. And I'm like, why? <laughs> it's like 10 hours away. You're never going to see the horse. And they'll say, well, you know, so-and-so he's like super famous with training and illusions or for whatever the breed is, you know, and he, oh my. And I, yeah. think, I think is, I mean, is that honestly what your young horse, I mean, what your young horse needs is exactly what you just described. It doesn't matter if the person is an expert in your breed, from my opinion, you can tell I'm passionate about this, but from my opinion, who cares? Like your horse doesn't need that breed expert at this point. Your young horse needs exactly what you just described. He also needs you. Mm -hmm. A big piece of having a reliable horse is the relationship that you develop with the horse. So if you send your horse to a trainer, especially if you're not involved, then your best outcome, best outcome is that horse has now bonded with that trainer mm. and works really well with that trainer. Mm. And now you still have to bond with the horse. You still have to know how to work with him. And I think exactly what you said is so important. Your horse is better off staying close to home, have the, and, and have good, solid, basic training um, that, that is um, focused on reliability and solid basics. Horses don't need specialized training when they're when they're young and first starting out. They need stability, and that's partly the stability of you, the person that the horse is already bonded with, still being involved. If you don't feel that you can train the horse at home or have a trainer come home, come to your place, and at least have them close enough that you can go visit mm -hmm. and watch every training session, make sure the trainer's working with you. Um, one of the better trainers I know in my area, probably the best trainer I know in my area, um, will not take a horse for training unless the person comes for lessons also. She says, there's no point in my training the horse if he goes back to the same person who didn't know how to train him in the first place and therefore does not know how to maintain his training. Yeah. And then, you know, that's, that's how people end up sending the same horse back, back to a trainer over and over again. And while we're on the subject of trainers, this is one that I'm passionate about. In our country, anybody can call himself a horse trainer. There is, there's no credentials required. And I have seen this on, I see this online routinely. People who do not know how to ride claim they are trainers. You can't teach a horse to respond consistently to cues if you can't balance yourself on the horse and give consistent cues. And people who don't understand basic, basic horse behavior, um, who, who have uh, things like the horse has to look at me with both eyes. That's supposed to be respectful. From a horse's perspective, that's disrespectful. Um, the licking and chewing thing, that doesn't mean your horse is digesting information. It means he's been overstressed and the stress is finally coming down. So people need to understand basic horse behavior in order to train effectively. So this is one of the things I'm passionate about because I, I just started working world well, a few months ago, started working with somebody who saw a horse. She said, she called me, she said, something tells me I need to buy this horse, but the trainer says she's dangerous. I looked at the videos, the trainer couldn't ride. The trainer had no concept of body language in lunging. And when the trainer finally fell off the horse, he declared her dangerous and said she should be euthanized. This horse is now with this woman and working beautifully, trying so hard to please. Wow. So even before we get to how much does the trainer know about my breed, how much does the trainer know about horses in general, their behavior, the importance of their emotional state, and the importance of the trainer knowing their own limitations. Mm -hmm. So that they know this, this is, you know, so that they actually have the skills. If you don't have the skills to ride and lunge, you probably don't have the skills to train. So, that, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and it, it's, it's sad, but you, you, you don't have to look far on the internet to see it, to see the, the examples of it. I agree. It's especially heartbreaking what you, that story you just described, it's so not fair to that horse. I mean, I don't know that horse, but that's not fair to that horse to give him such a judgment. You know, I mean, I think right. from a trainer standpoint, 
it is fair sometimes to say to eat some humble pie and to say, Hey, I don't mesh with this horse or, um, to be honest, I don't do well with this kind of horse. You know, I think that can be very fair to a horse, but to be so dismissive is, uh, wow, that's pretty heavy. <laughs> I, you know, and this, I think this kind of comes back to our original topic that, um, we have to understand that there are variations in horse behavior. And so, um, there's there's certain training methods that work that, that people can get away with with um, quarter horse types because they're fairly tolerant of this. But if you take an Arabian or a thoroughbred and you think you're going to make an impression on them by um, more and more laps around a round pen, um, mm -hmm. you can end up with a horse who is just so stressed and and his brain is just gone. Yes. And that and then it's it's grossly unfair to blame the horse and say well this horse is dangerous as you said you need to know your limitations and be able to say i don't work well with this kind of horse or this horse and i didn't click you need to find somebody else and i'll, I'll help you find somebody who worked better with this horse um and that that is that to me is the professional ap approach to it i i know personally i work well with horses that other people call stubborn Take the horse who says, I'm not moving and you can't make me. I get along really well with them. <laughs> the, the ones, the ones that, that, that want to run for five miles before they get their brain in gear, not so much. Right, right. So, you yeah. know, and then I know that about myself. So I don't, you know, I don't pretend that I, that I know how to do something I don't know how to do. Yeah, and I guess, you know, as we wrap up, the point is, what you just described that horse that kind of needs to needs to run a bit before they all get it all clicking and firing that could be in any breed you know i mean generally speaking yeah. it's going to be could be more in some breeds than others but again just to kind of put a bow on all of this it's like there could be that kind of horse in any breed and that's what makes it fun i think i think it's they're all so individual. And I love that. And I remember one time years ago, I was looking for a horse to buy and somebody said, what, what breed are you looking for? And I hadn't even thought that I said, Oh God, gosh, I don't know. I, you know, a good horse is a good horse. You can find a good horse in any breed that, that suits exactly. me. that's what I mean by good is what, what suits me, but. Well, that's right. It's the good match. That's what's yeah. really important. I mean, for an owner to be happy with a horse, they have to be a good match. And I've met many wonderful horses with wonderful owners who were a bad match for each other. And it was nobody's fault. And hopefully this, that happens less between um, horses and trainers because we should be more adaptable. But it's still going to happen. Yeah. Nobody's, nobody's going to be, nobody gets along perfectly with everybody. Yeah. So as we wrap up, I want, uh, we're going to post in the description below in the video, the link to Lynn's article that she wrote on this topic. It's a good read because it's uh, three or four points. I think you make Lynn on what make, what constitutes a good trainer, what, what you should look for in a trainer. Do you want to yes. say more about that? And then I had like one little piece I wanted to add to it, but, but um, so people can think about this before they read your article, but did you have anything you wanted to add there? Oh, well, yes, my husband says I should add that when I was horse hunting, I said I would never buy an Arab. <laughs> See? And, and can't I, be got, I, I, I got so frustrated. Somebody finally said, well, if you're desperate enough, you can go look at some Arabs. And I saw bronze and it was his behavior, his particular personality. I saw that he was, he just had that, uh, um, he had a sense of humor. He, he, he thinks for himself. And he has a way of making his point without ever getting dangerous. And there was just something about him. It was like, this is the horse I've always been waiting for. Well, the fact that he was an Arab, didn't matter. of course, then it didn't matter at all. And then I started realizing how wonderful Arabs can be and, and what a cool history they have. I love so, stories. Anyway, that, that yeah, I love stories like that. Well, in your article, you say, um, and this is a nice tie in with the Arabs, you say one of the traits of a good, good, uh, trainers that they have solid horsemanship, not to state the obvious, but then that also they can ride, you know, they can be in balance. And again, I think that's a value, a value comes from riding different breeds, I think, because they the mechanics of the different style of horses is a different riding experience to learn to follow that elastic suspended movement of something like an Arabian or a warm blood um, is important. I think if you're 
going to ride a range of horses, even within a breed, because if you ride breeds that typically are really flat moving, um, or they've been trained to move that way, and then you ride one that really wants to move through its back and has spring, your seat is going to lock it down and shut it down. If you haven't, <laughs> if you haven't gotten used to following that. So a huge benefit, I think, to learning to follow different movement types with your seat, uh, because then you can bring out Absolutely. the best horse. Yes. Yes. And, and I think too, that the more experience we have with the more different horses, the fewer horses seem like problems to us because we've just developed more skills and more um, uh, creativity in how to reach and work with, with each individual horse and bring out the best in them. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree with you. Cause you're not coming from this place of whether well, or not fitting in this little square box that I've, that I've crafted, you know, and, and they need to, they need to fit this, this, and it's like, no, they're, they're an individual. They might not fit their stereotype of their breed at all. And that's okay. You know, let's treat them for what they are and celebrate their gifts. So, well, well yes. And not make a judgment over the value of a horse. Every horse is valuable and every horse of course is very valuable to the person who loves him. And so each one deserves to be treated with the, the best we can give them. Yes, absolutely. And in terms of finding trainers to help you, and I think your article is a great resource, you can look outside of people who just work with your breed. And I encourage people to do that because sometimes if when trainers only work with one breed, they can get blinders on. We all can get blinders on. <laughs> um, we're always trying to open the blinders a bit more. So if you need help with your horse, you don't have to go to somebody who just works with your breed, you know, follow some of this guidelines that Lynn has laid out in the article to find a trainer that works. A good trainer is a good trainer. Just like a good horse is a good horse. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, super. Well, I think Zoom is probably going to kick us off here any second. Uh, my screen is doing funny things. I think so. <laughs> um. Anyway, let's see. Uh, any questions come in here that we should clear up? You see any questions in the chat? No, no I can not see them all. Okay. Okay, great. Well, we will catch you in the, in the next talk. The topic, I think, as we discussed, Lynn, was uh, cute behaviors your horse might do that might actually indicate there's stress or discomfort or worry. Is that correct? Or something like that. I'm paraphrasing. That's that. That's what you had suggested. Yes. Okay. That sounds super fun. Maybe we, and maybe we could also add cute behaviors that maybe just are not good behaviors. Uh, might, might indicate some behavior problems that need to be addressed um, or, or uh, adjusted, redirected. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. They were cute when they started and now they've escalated and definitely not cute. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. <laughs> I, I like it. <laughs> all right. Sure, we can all think of some. <laughs> Great. Well, we will catch you all in the next next month's chat. We'll get the links all up. Okay. Take care. Thanks, Lynn. I'll see you soon. Thank you, Jack. Bye. Bye.